Today, as we conclude our sermon series, we're going to talk about the big finish. And uh, the theme of the Hebrew writer is uh, a sports analogy. He talks about running the race and how you, how you compete. And we have the Summer Olympics coming up in, uh, in the month of August. And the other day I was sitting in my office and I was kind of, I had my sermon all together, but uh, the most important part of the sermon is the introduction and the conclusion, and I didn't have that all together, and I was looking up some stories on maybe some Olympians and how they train and, and how that would apply to what the Hebrew writer was saying, and uh, kind of like a, a light came on, uh, God said, duh. You have someone in your church that can give a personal testimony of exactly what you're looking for. And so I contacted Rachel Wegford, and uh, she's going to share with us this morning. She is a student at Shattuck St. Mary's School in Faribault, Minnesota. And any words I mispronounce, she'll forgive me for that. She is preparing for a career in figure skating while completing her high school education. She's engaged in a rigorous curriculum while committing herself to the demands of practice, competition, and performance. And so we're going to ask Rachel if she would to come now and share with us. It's on? Oh, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Rachel, as Pastor just said. Um, so... <laughs> Where do I start? Um, I'm a figure skater, and I love what I do. And since that, did I trust in God and, like, my whole start of it. And I had the opportunity of going to school in a different state. So now I go to a boarding school. And um, really, like, it's really hard out there. I mean, I don't have a normal life anymore, as some would put it. Not really normal because I can't go out every weekend with my friends and stuff. You know, I have to sit, study, skate. Um, so it's really, it's really hard being out there without, um, like, close family and friends. So it's really important to have people encouraging me in that I do have God. And God does encourage me in that way. Um, there are great things about this. I love to do. We travel a lot. We get to do a lot of awesome things. But in life, there are a lot of struggling, especially in this training. I mean, one day, a good day, another day, a bad day. So sometimes it's really hard. But, um, you know, I trust God and what he's doing. Um, I mean, every once in a while, I do want a normal life. I mean, who wants to wake up at 5 in the morning? go and skate before I have to go study and then in the middle of the day go back and study and then um, go skate and then go back to study. I mean, it's just back and forth. It's pretty crazy. Um, (laughs) um, But God's not calling me for that normal life. God's calling me to go for bigger things, greater things, because this is what he put me out there to do and to lead people to for his purpose. So that's really awesome and I mean, I mean, some days, like, you know, it's hard. I'll, some days you're like, oh, I just don't want to do this. I want to give up. But God doesn't let me do that. He says, come on, you can keep going. And, yeah. So, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, <laughs> um, so, no matter how tired I get, he's always there for me. I don't have family out there, but I do have close friends. And in that way, God has led me to... Um, leading people to Christ and all that fun stuff that I get to share. So, yeah. We love you. You can just lay it it in on the front row. We appreciate Rachel so much. She wasn't out there hardly a week until she invited someone to church and that girl accepted Christ as her savior. But uh, we can see the sacrifice that she has to make in order to be able to compete. Yesterday, she was in a competition. I didn't tell you that the day I was thinking of this was Friday, and she's been in two competitions since then, and so that, uh, that added to the, the difficulty for her. But yesterday, she was in a competition, and she had a personal best. And uh, we're looking forward to the day when she's competing with the best in the world, and she's on the platform receiving those 
rewards. But uh, that just doesn't happen. You don't just get up one day and say, hey, I like to skate. I'm going to go compete somewhere. Uh, it takes a lot of work. And uh, th that's kind of what the uh, writer of the Hebrews is talking about here. Uh, throughout the entire book of Hebrews, the revelation has, has been coming from the very first verses of, of Hebrews 1 where it talks about uh, Jesus being the, the Son of God and that in the last days God has spoken to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. And then going back to the Old Testament and the, the sacrifices and the ceremonies of the Old Testament and, and explaining to these people who, who were Hebrew people, they, they understood what this, the, the, what this was all about. They had practiced the, this religion from their childhood and how Jesus fulfilled all of these different areas of being the very high priest, the, the one who offered the sacrifice for us. And uh, last week at, at the beginning of chapter 10, the Hebrew writer says, since we have such a great high priest, Jesus Christ, and he went on and gave us about five different things that began with, let us, let us do these things. And now this week, he, as we come to the, the end of the, the book of Hebrews, we see the big finish in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, and on through uh, chapter 12 and verse 24. And if you, if you uh, were here last Sunday, you realized that I cut off the last part of the message. I talked too much and didn't get to the third point, and that's okay. But uh, part of what we are to do is to put our faith into action because we have such a great high priest, Jesus Christ. We are to put our faith in action. And in Hebrews chapter 11, it's all about stories of people who put their faith in action. And uh, we're going to look at just a few of those at the beginning of the chapter. And the first one is Abel. Abel offered what God wanted, but Cain offered what he wanted. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain. By faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. But, and by faith he still speaks even though he is dead. You, you see, God had a standard. God had an expectation. God said, this is what you were to offer. And Abel offered what God wanted, but his brother Cain offered what he wanted. And, and there's a lot of that kind of philosophy, even of it being preached from pulpits, and you can hear it on the radio, you can see it on television, you can uh, listen to it on podcasts, you can read about it on blogs uh, of, of this philosophy, well, you just give what you want. No, God has given us his command. He said that we are to honor him with the first 10% of all that we are to earn. And some people say, well, no, I, I give my 2%, I give my 3%, I throw my 10 bucks in every week that is every week that I'm there. Um, uh, but Abel gave what God wanted and he was approved. He was blessed for what he had given. Cain gave what he wanted to give and he wasn't. And there's many examples of this kind of thing in scripture. In uh, the reign of uh, King Saul, Samuel was the prophet, and, and, and he came to Saul, and he said, this is God, what God wants you to do. You are to go out into the battle, and you are to, to win the battle. God will be with you, and you will win, but you are not to bring any of the plunder back to Jerusalem. Nothing. Everything is supposed to stay there. Do not bring anything back into the city of Jerusalem. And so Saul goes out. They win the war. He comes back. And Samuel the prophet comes to Saul and says, God is not pleased with you. And Saul said, well, well, why not? We did what God told us to do. And Saul said, what is this I hear? The bleeding of sheep. He could hear the sheep that were out there. And uh, Saul said, oh, it's okay. Uh, I want to, I brought back these sheep so that we could sacrifice them to God and honor God for the victory. And Samuel said these words that apply to all of us today, God prefers obedience to sacrifice. 
You see, we can say, well, I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to do that for God. We need to go to the word of God and find out what he wants us to do. Abel applied his faith. He put his faith into action, and God was honored. And then Enoch. Enoch pleased Please, God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. I mean, these are men from ancient times, even before the writing of the, of the Ten Commandments, even before the establishment of the nation of Israel. They're listed as heroes of faith because they put their faith into action by obeying God. They pleased God. And then uh, Noah was the next one that is mentioned in Hebrews 11. And Noah built an ark in holy fear. Now, you have to... You have to kind of put yourself in the place where, where Noah was. At the time of Noah, it had not yet rained. When, when God uh, created the world, there was a, a mist, and there was the canopy of clouds above, and, and then the, the water on the earth, and the earth was kind of watered by a, a dew type of, of, a, of an effect, and uh, it had not yet rained. And God said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. Well, there were no, there had been no boats, there had been no rain. I mean, he was out in the middle of the land. Uh, why would, why would you build a boat? There were all kinds of reasons for Noah to disobey God. No one else was doing it. Nobody, you know, he was kind of in my category with liking the heat. You know, nobody else was doing it. And so, why, why would he uh, build an ark? Why would he build a boat? But he did. And in Hebrews eleven seven, it says, "By faith." Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. He was obedient in holy fear. Not, not necessarily just being afraid of God, but that he reverenced God as, as the, the one that he should fear and that he should follow. And then the writer of Hebrews goes on and talks about Abraham and Sarah and how they believe God. In Hebrews 11:8, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as inheritance, he obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. I mean, th again, this was in, in pagan times. He was living in a pagan land. Uh, th there were many false gods that were being worshipped. And Abraham heard the voice of God speak to him. And he said, leave your father, leave your father's household, leave your father's country, and go into a land where I will show you. Abraham didn't even know where he was going. I mean, even if he'd have had GPS, he wouldn't have even known what location to put into it. He just went because God told him to go, and they were obedient uh, and went where God told them to go. And then later, God promised them a, a son, and uh, they went to, on to the ages of 90 and 100 before the, that promise was given. And then in that same story, that promised son that they loved so much, God said, sacrifice him to me. And they trusted God, and God provided a sacrifice. They didn't have to, uh, to uh, kill their son Isaac, but they went in obedience, the, the obedience. And so we need to put our faith in action. It, it's one thing to say, I believe. Or we believe and, and say, well, these are the things that we believe in. And we, we believe in God. We believe in the promises of God. We believe that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. That's, that's good. But uh, the, the writer James says even Satan does that. Or Peter, I believe it's Peter that said it. That, that even Satan believes that Jesus is the son of God, but it doesn't save him. It's not our faith. It's putting our faith into practice. We have to put our faith in, to practice, just like Rachel did and her family did when the opportunity opened for her to go. She just didn't say, well, someday I'd like to be a figure skater. But they literally put their faith into action and allowed her to go. And she went and she's doing the work that, uh, that needs to be done to become the figure skater she would like to be. 
And that's, that's the approach that we need to give in our faith to God. It's not just, well, yeah, I believe. It's not just an idea. It's putting our faith into action. Then the second thing that the Hebrew writer says, and this is where we get more into the sports illustration, is to endure hardships as, dis- as discipline. And he says that we are to throw off everything that hinders. In Hebrews chapter 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Here, the, the illustration that he is using is, is running a race. And, and when you watch the Olympics, you will notice that those who are running races don't have even a whole lot of clothing on. They, they wear the limited amount. And in a lot of these different sports, swimming in particular and, and, and diving and other things, they try to figure out how to use the clothing to make them even faster or even better than what, you, than what they do. And when, when you're watching the Olympics, you're not going to see any young ladies running track with long flowing skirts because they could trip you up. You, you don't see anybody running in, in a race to win the race carrying a, pa- a backpack. You know, for so much of us, we say, oh, well, I don't want to give that up because I might need it someday. You know, we have all this extra stuff that we don't really need. But when you're, when you're running the race, you lay aside everything that would hinder you. Uh, Rachel mentioned about, you know, sometimes just being able to go out with your friends for a junior in high school, that's just a normal thing to do. But if you have a competition tomorrow, uh, say, say Saturday, uh, you don't go out Friday night with your friends. You've got to be prepared for that competition on Saturday. And, and these are the things that he is saying to us here. And that we must run with perseverance. You must run with perseverance. It, it doesn't help to be winning at the end of the first 100 yards if you're running a mile race. You must persevere. You know, there, there's sometimes the person who is leading on the first lap of a mile race doesn't even come into the end of the competition to receive any kind of award. We must run the race with perseverance. No one said that living the Christian life was easy. And as I alluded to last week, in our country, I believe that it's going to become less easy all the time. There's going to become more difficulties that we face, maybe even persecutions that we could face in this nation to be a Christian. But that doesn't mean we should quit. That doesn't mean that we should give up. That doesn't mean that that, uh, everybody else is wrong. We simply need to run the race that is set before us with perseverance. Don't quit, don't give up, don't just get discouraged, don't get depressed, but keep on running the race that God has given us. And then he also says, fix our eyes on Jesus. If you notice these, he's back into saying, let us again, let us throw off everything that hinders, let us run with perseverance, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. It's the body of Christ together encouraging one another and helping one another along these ways. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here, here we see that Jesus has already persevered through everything that we face in our lives. I've shared this illustration with you before uh, about my youngest son when he uh, played soccer. He's going to be here next Sunday from North Carolina, and we're looking forward to next weekend for our family to be able to be here. But uh, my youngest son was always fast, and uh, he, he always loved to run. And when he, he's, that's crazier than like in hot weather, I think. But anyway, uh, he always loved to run. And so when he was in soccer, there was one other guy that was fast like he was, and they would finish first. And they had a rule that the coach had put 
that there was a certain amount of time and everyone on the team had to finish running their laps by that time or everybody would have to race or run the, the, the laps again. And so when these first two guys would finish their race, they'd go back to the end and they would pace the guys at the back to try to help them run a little bit faster so that the whole team wouldn't have to run the laps again. And I see that as a picture here of Jesus with us. Keep our eyes on Jesus. He's already run the race. He's already persevered. He's already faced the persecution. He already has died on the cross. He's already won. He's victorious. And now he's running with us and encouraging us. And we keep our eyes on Jesus because he is going to take us through to help us win the victory. It is through Jesus Christ that we win the victory. And in Hebrews 12, 11, it says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You know, I, I again, think of Rachel and, and all the other young people there that are at that school. There are some mornings at five and o'clock in the morning, they don't want to get out of bed and do the work that they need to do in their training. And uh, there's times when they, after doing their training, they may not want to go and sit in the classroom. And there's times when they need to be studying that they'd be rather be, be out doing something with their friends, but, but they have to discipline themselves. But they have a goal. They want to achieve something. And when they achieve something, it will be because they discipline themselves when they were younger in order to be at the place where they're able to accomplish what they have set out to accomplish. And the same thing is true in the Christian life. There are things that are known as spiritual disciplines. If we want to be growing Christians, there are some things that we need to do, and we need to be self-disciplined. We may need to get up a little earlier in the morning so we have time to pray before we go out and face our day. Uh, we, we need to take time every day to allow God's word to speak to our heart. Uh, we need to focus. Uh, we all have areas of temptation. And, and whatever that temptation is in your life, it takes discipline to say no. And it especially takes discipline to say no when everybody around you is saying yes. You know, there are some things, as, as I grow older, some of these health issues, there are things that uh, when I have to say no, everybody else around me is not enjoying it because it's not hurting them. But if I enjoyed that cake or, you know, some of, there's, uh, I've got a list so long of what I'm not supposed to have, I have to break the rules sometime or I wouldn't have anything but water. So, you know, but, uh, but when everybody else is enjoying something, you have to have the self-discipline to say no. And, and so when you're going through the discipline, it's not easy. It's not easy getting up earlier to pray. It's not easy to make sure that you're in God's word every day. It's not easy to, to say no to some things that maybe your friends are doing, but you know that for your testimony and, and for your growth in Christ, you need to. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I'm going to make a statement here, and I want you to follow closely with me. If there's not something in your Christian life that is difficult for you to do, you need to examine your Christian life. There ought to be some things that you're doing that you have to make a specific decision that is not easy for you to do so that you are following Christ and becoming more Christ-like. There's always something, some kind of discipline that it takes to achieve what God has for you. Salvation is free. Jesus paid for it at the cross. But if we want to grow in him, if we want to become more like him, there is discipline that takes place in our life. And then the third thing that we want to notice is to live for your future hope. Live for your future hope. Rachel went away to, to the school in Minnesota. I can't imagine living in that kind of cold weather, but anyway, uh, going to Minnesota as a 
10th grader in high school. And someday, when she achieves what she is looking to achieve, when somebody is actually paying for her livelihood to see her figure skate, when that's her profession, she will be able to look back and say it was because of the discipline that I endured. But what she has to do now is to put in the discipline, to, to live what she is called to do in order that she can achieve what she wants to achieve. You don't achieve it the same day that you sacrifice for it. And that's the same way that it is for believers in Jesus Christ. We're not living for this world. We're not living for now. We're living for the hope that we have for the future in Jesus Christ. And we need to always keep that in focus. Sometimes people around us will not be following Christ. Some people will be doing things that, that are, are you know, very sinful, maybe even criminal, and yet they are able to achieve and go higher uh, even though they're not doing what is right. But we need to remember that we are focusing on our future hope. The Hebrew writer says that we are not at the Zion of old, and he describes that just very briefly for us in Hebrews 12, 18 to 21. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. This was the description of when God came down on the mountain to give Moses the Ten Commandments. It, it, the power of God was such an awesome thing and such a difficult thing that the people begged Moses not to let the presence of God to come down on them again. And Moses, who went into this great presence of God, was himself fearful, even though he had been invited there by God himself. And so Moses, on behalf of the people, asked for God to restrain the glory and, and the power of his presence because the people were afraid. And the Hebrew writer is saying to these New Testament believers whose roots were in Judaism, he was saying, you're not coming to the Old Testament mount. You're not coming to the mount of Moses. You're not coming to the mount where the, the commandments were given. You're not coming to this awesome, fearful uh, rage of, of God that, that everyone was afraid of, but your hope is in the heavenly Jerusalem the new Jerusalem. And he describes that for us a little bit in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteousness, excuse me, of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better word than the blood of Abel. It is the very presence of God that we are looking forward to, that someday we will spend all of eternity in his presence. Now, I know that the Bible teaches us about streets of gold, and there are older translations into the English that talk about mansions, and, you know, there are some people that their view of heaven is no, no less materialistic than what their view of earth is. But what makes heaven heaven is the presence of God, to be in his presence forever. And it's not this fearful, trembling I can't come close, but this is the presence of God where we can be in his presence. And, 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 and it says that we come to the judge of all men. The judge of all men. Sometimes we look at that negative. But if we are doing what is right, and if we are doing what is good, the judge gives us the, the award as we think of the Olympics coming up. 
if everybody ran the race or competed in their competition and there was no judge to determine who wins and loses, there could be no prize. It would kind of be like our politically correct system where every, ch every child gets a plaque or a, a trophy or a, a ribbon. It would be meaningless. But the judge of all the earth will be there to welcome us and to say, well done, and to give us those rewards that he feels that we deserve from our earthly existence. It is the heavenly, the heavenly city for which the writer had told us about that the faith heroes long to see. It'll be that day when, when all of the discipline and all of the living for God and all the sacrifice and all the work and all the prayer and, and all the, the obedience to God that we've talked about this morning, when it all comes to fruition and we stand in his presence and we know that we're there forever and ever and ever to celebrate his glory. That is the hope that we look forward to. We don't go to the old mountain. We go to the new Jerusalem that is coming down from God. And the harvest of our eternal home in heaven is worth the sacrifice of living for Jesus now. Sometimes living for Jesus is difficult, but it will be worth it all. In Revelation chapter, go ahead. In Revelation chapter 21, the, the John the, who saw the revelation said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sin. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That's why we live the Christian life. That's why we live in obedience by faith. That's why we put our faith is, into action, because we have the blessed hope of spending eternity with Jesus and to have him welcome us. I have a question for us this morning as we conclude this message. What would the impact be in our world if Christians today would take their faith as seriously as Rachel and other athletes like her take their training? How would it change your life if you took up your cross daily and followed him? In Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 37, Jesus said, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. This wasn't just believers. It was the crowd with his disciples, and he said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What is it that you're pursuing? And is the result worth the pursuit? It, is, it, is it worth the pursuit that you have? Is your relationship with Jesus an event that's added to your life like an appointment on your calendar? Like the family this morning, okay, it's church time, we're going to go to church for an hour. Now that's good, I'm not discouraging you from coming to church, you should come to church. But that should be just a starting point. That's where we come together and we worship and we rally together and we're encouraged to go back out. But we're really the church out there in the world. We need to go back out and, and live for him. It's not just an appointment on your calendar. Are you taking up your cross to follow Jesus daily? Do you put your faith into action in your life? If someone that works with you or lives in your home or someone in your community were to be here today, could they give testimony on your behalf that they know you're a Christian because they see the way 
that you live and the work that you do? Do you endure hardship as discipline necessary to become who Jesus wants you to be? It's not easy to become like Jesus. Jesus died on a cross. Jesus was rejected. Jesus was despised. Jesus was beaten. He was hated. It's not easy to become like Jesus. Oh, it sounds real sweet in the 21st century. I want to be more like Jesus. But do we? Are we living the life to become more like Jesus? Jesus.